Hello there, hope you're doing really, really good. Daniel here back after a Labor Day break. Um, feeling a little bit nervous. <laughs> it's funny, you know, it's like, kind of like when you've not worked for a couple of days and you go back and you feel like, oh, things are new and how did I do this again, etc. But, uh, but again, of course, super excited to be back. And we have a comment from uh, Dr. Jessica C. I'm just going to say Jessica. Uh, uh, one follow-up question from from John from last from a, a episode last week, and also an email from Dvorak. Uh, so let's let's start with this comment from from Jessica, and this is a comment on uh, episode forty three, uh, which is about this uh, entity called paradoxical insomnia, and we'll, we'll uh, comment on that in a second here. Um, and by the way, actually, let me do this right away. Uh, I have. Uh, oftentimes I realize that a lot of people may be completely new to, to the podcast or the YouTube channel and a lot of things I talk about may may seem, you know, unfamiliar or strange or whatnot. And so I'm going to try to do this more regularly and say that if you're completely new, then uh, check out the first episodes, you know, episode 1 through 10 or even through 20. Uh, those are where I go, kind of the basics uh, of how to you know get get better uh, using these techniques known as cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and uh, so yeah, basically what I talk about here is called CBTI. But uh, as I've learned more and more, I, I've included other things too, like mindfulness-based therapy and ACT, etc. So anyway, just a little comment there. So if you're new, check out the first episode. So um, let's go um, uh, back to this comment I was going to read. So here it is. Uh, yes, uh, catching up all on all of your videos, they're fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for your support. Really, really, whenever somebody says something like that, it's, uh, it makes me so happy. All right, back to the message. This happens to me when I'm stressed about sleep. I think I haven't fallen asleep, and after an hour or two, I get, I get up frustrated and anxious from not sleeping. I'll get out of bed and sit on the couch, and sometimes I've even taken a Benadryl while waiting to get drowsy, and then it will hit me. I had a dream of the REM variety, spooky. I'm starting CBTI again and not sure how to sleep log or when to get out of bed. I usually guess that if it's been more than an hour and I'm in the same position, I've probably been sleeping. I haven't heard much about this problem though. Of note, as soon as I realize that I've had a REM type dream, I calm down and sleep deeper. All right, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, going back to what the video that Jessica was commenting on was about that video was about paradoxical insomnia, which is this this uh, type of insomnia. Let's call it that, where you um, you actually you sleep much more than you perceive sleeping. In kind of the extreme case, somebody f feels like they don't sleep at all, nothing, and they actually sleep, you know, seven hours, which is very unusual. Very very unusual. It happens, but it's very unusual. Mostly, it's something akin to, you know. Somebody estimates that they're sleeping two and a half hours when they actually slept four and a half, or they think they slept three when they actually slept five, something like that. And by the way, almost everybody with insomnia has some component of paradoxical insomnia. Ten, you know, people that don't have trouble sleeping tend to overestimate how much they sleep by an hour. Actually, most people sleep six hours but think they sleep seven. To simplify a little bit, and most people with insomnia tend to be the other way around. They tend to underestimate how much they sleep. Now. Um, so that said, going to this uh, question, yeah, sounds like you may have a component of paradoxical insomnia here, um, uh, Jessica. And now there were two things that I th thought were really important to comment on. One was this one. You're starting CBT again, not sure how to sleep, log or when to get out of bed. Well, um, the more, you know, if you, if somebody decides to check out like episode one, where I go over like what's called bedtime restriction, kind of one of the core CBT techniques. Um, in that one, I say, ask yourself how much you need to sleep and subtract an hour. So if you think you need seven hours, then start by spending six hours in bed. You know, the more and more I do this, both here on the channel and in clinic, I realize that for almost everyone, for almost everyone, it becomes appropriate to spend about six hours in bed or six and a half, five and a half, somewhere around there. But for really for almost everyone, picking a number of six works. So uh, if somebody out there is like, yeah, I don't want to do any math, I'm just going to pick a number, maybe pick six, pick six, pick six hours. Um, and, and so that said, let's say somebody picks six hours, let's say you pick six hours, Jessica, then how would you, how you, what would be the next step be? Well, the next step would be to pick um, an, an, uh, a time to get out of bed. And 
it's not important when that is as long as it's consistent. So if you say, I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. every day, that works great. Uh, sometimes people say, when I do this in clinics, sometimes people are like, oh, I think I'd like to get out of it at, at 8. And then I say, well, then you have to stay up until 2 a.m. And then they're like, whoa, oh, let me, let me think about that. So oftentimes I feel like picking an earlier time works better. It's easier to do like 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. than, you know, 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. for most people. But that's it again. Just pick a time that is good. And, and uh, the most important thing is to stick with it. Uh, and so let's say somebody picks uh, 6 a.m. and that means they shouldn't go to bed before midnight. But then if it is midnight and, and they don't feel sleepy, then you should wait. Never go to bed unless you feel sleepy. Uh, but the wake up time is very important. So even if in the beginning what happens often is that people are kind of like, you know, whenever you try something new, you're a little bit like apprehensive. You're thinking, is this going to work or not? How is it going to help me? And that in itself can make it hard to sleep. So oftentimes people end up having a really tough first couple of days where they they don't sleep well, even though they go to bed late and they have to get up early and, and feel really tired. But if you keep going, then things start falling into place, meaning you have a two kind of a short, you know, little sleep nights, you still get up early, well, then your sleep drive, your need to sleep increases. And then by the third night, maybe you'll start like, okay, fall asleep quicker, sleep through the night, etc. So just some thoughts on, on that. And by the way, how to sleep log, I think the simpler, the better. Um, just, uh, you can, you can print these sleep diaries online, although t the, most of them that are, that are online tend to be kind of complicated. So I think you can just, you know, pick any piece of paper and write down what time you went to bed, um, how much you slept, what time you get up, how many things, how many times you remember waking up. Plus, I think this is actually even more important to be honest with you, logging how you feel during the day. And it could just be one thing like, how do I feel today? Uh, on a scale of one to five or one to 10, like I felt great or I felt terrible. Like, and, and, and that's really important because all, you know, I feel, I, this is what I feel like the first kind of two weeks of starting using CBTI or th these type of techniques uh, is is really good to, to log, to like kind of get into routine and keep yourself accountable and, and log things. But the more, the, the further you, uh, you move, the further you get from that initial two weeks, the more it becomes about kind of the opposite actually, to stop logging eventually, to stop thinking about sleep, to d get attention elsewhere. And uh, so I guess that was just a comment. I felt I was going to another place there, but yeah, so that's, that's important. But going back to why it's good to, okay, now I see where I was going. <laughs> now I remember where I was going. Why it is important to also in your logs include like how you feel. It's because that, that becomes more and more important because the further you go along, the more you want to focus on how you feel rather than what time you went to bed, how much you slept, etc. And, and, and the more we eventually focus on that, the better sleep becomes. And that, that, you know, how we feel should always be the goal. You know, if our goal is to get X amount of sleep, then that just leads to frustration and, and clock watching. But if our goal is to feel good, that takes uh, attention away from sleep. So that's good to start with even from the beginning. All right, very good. Um, now, um, the other thing was uh, this one. I So Jessica wrote, I realized that if I've had a REM type dream, I calm down and sleep better. I think this is um, my interpretation of that or I think when I read that is, um, again, sleep is all about confidence. When we, uh, somebody that has no trouble sleeping, they basically have solid, like 100% sleep confidence. They don't doubt it at all. They know that they're gonna go to bed and sleep. And they do. Uh, and, and by the way, if they have an off night where they don't sleep, if their sleep confidence is really high, they don't really pay any mind. They're like, oh, that was odd. I didn't, didn't sleep much yesterday. Well, okay. And then and then the sleep confidence is on, on you know, is still there. So the next night they sleep good again. But when you have insomnia, uh, you know, sleep confidence isn't there. You know, we question how, um, if we're going to sleep, how much we're going to sleep, etc. So where I'm going with this is to say that I think that if somebody um, like yourself, Jessica, you get out of bed, when you can't sleep and then you kind of doze off and then you realize, whoa, I had a dream. I was really sleeping there. That kind of like, I feel maybe like boosting sleep confidence. And then, uh, and then that, you know, you're like, oh, I slept, I can sleep, you know, and then 
then you sleep better that uh, the following um, few hours or several hours or whatnot. So a little comment there on sleep confidence. So um, I want to say to you, Jessica, thank you so much for these comments. Super, super helpful. And, uh, and, and you know, any more questions, please keep them coming. Uh, okay. Now, now let's move on to this email from John uh, for background if you want. I made a reply to John uh, that was, uh, I believe it was Friday, a couple of days ago, and it's, it's episode pod 42. And, um, and so let's say, let's just read this uh, email here. Quick question, for this sleep restriction or bedtime restriction, um, if it isn't working as efficiently, what would you suggest regarding bumping up the sleep restriction to kick in? Right now, I'm at uh, six hours. Would you suggest five hours or ultimately don't you don't want to limit uh, uh, to less time? I appreciate your response. Um, first of all, thank you, John, for, for sharing these questions. They are, as I just said to Jessica, extremely helpful. Anybody else out there has a question, please leave a comment or email me. Now, to answer your question, um, the kind of classical thinking when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy from Sami is that if you've done, if you spent, let's say, six hours in bed and, uh, and it, it, you know, you're still having trouble sleeping, then you should spend even less time in bed. Uh, and if you go back to the first kind of episodes in, uh, of this channel, uh, I, that's kind of what I was saying to people that you should, you could try that, uh, as, as as I'm becoming <laughs> older and wiser here, I, I'm not sure that is actually the best thing thing to do. I actually believe much more now in in just you know set it and forget it. Like pick some pick a time and then continue with it. So if somebody says you know I'm gonna spend six hours in bed and then you know a week later or even you know maybe nine ten days later they're like oh, still not sleeping that great probably best thing to do is just keep keep going like don't change anything just keep getting up at for example six keep staying awake during the day don't go to bed before midnight and just keep going because the more we change things the oftentimes the more kind of anxious and you know we start questioning how that's going to work etc so um i think for most people that are doing the what's called bedtime restriction or sleep restriction um the best thing to do is just keep going uh, uh, and uh, when the number is six, th th that said, sometimes people pick a number of like people say, "Oh, I'm, I'm doing a bedtime restriction. I'm only spending eight hours in bed." That may be too much, but so for that person, it's probably good to go down to seven or six hours. But uh, if somebody is at six hours uh, and it's like within the first two weeks, probably best thing is just keep going. Uh, uh, that say, it's, it's not wrong to say, "I'm gonna." I'm going to tighten this up even more, but for most people, I think just keep going is the best thing. That said, if, if somebody has been at six hours for like, you know, more than two weeks and, and still like not sleeping during the day, still has a hard time falling asleep and staying asleep, then it's probably good to say, to go down to even less. But, uh, but I think that's the minority. So, okay, John, hope this was helpful. And just as I said to, to Jessica, please, uh, uh, send me another question if you have one and then finally we're going to go over to an email that is a little bit longer one and uh actually it's not that long when i see it but it is from ed work and it came in four days ago so let's read this hello daniel first of all sorry for my bad english no problem at all i i, I, I get everything you're saying here and by the way thank you so much for for uh, reaching out uh okay I appreciate your efforts and your work. I saw your videos on your YouTube channel and I'm a big fan. Uh, <laughs> cool, thanks so much. Um, okay, uh, I am 31 years old. I have been suffering from insomnia this last four months. I searched on the internet what can cause my insomnia and I found the case SFI and FFI. And for those of you who don't know what this is, uh, you know, I, I'm personally like, I said this many times, but I'm almost conflicted to talk about this because there are these two conditions that I personally feel should never have been called insomnias. They're more like prime diseases. They're more like neurological uh, conditions. But as part of it, you know, people sleep less and, and they've been dubbed insomnia. So oftentimes people are really worried that they have these conditions. So anyway, just a little comment there. 
Let's keep reading. I know that prion of FFI disease is caused by genetic mutation and no one in my family has died from this. Uh, but I keep thinking that I may have the sporadic form of the disease. In the last three months, I keep telling to myself that I have this prion and I will die. And on the first three months, um, I had trouble sleeping sometimes. I can have a good night, but sometimes only three or four hours. When I wake up, I feel that I didn't have deep sleep and uh, feel energetic. Um, I have no neurological symptoms for these first three months, except I was trembling and shaking my legs and my hands, my teeth also. My doctor said it's normal if you're anxious. He gives me antidepressant and SSR and SSRI. Anyway, I'm really worried uh, that I could have this disease this month. And I have problems with my memory, especially my short-term memory. Like I forget what I ate yesterday and sometimes my thoughts are not clear. Like I have an idea in my brain and sometimes I don't find the right words. And after I forget, I was thinking I don't have a, I forget I was thinking. I don't have a tax. So yeah, I like balancing on my walk, except trembling and shaking. I can judge and do normal things. I drive to work, etc. I can calculate and do some exercise. What I'm worried about is even if I'm tired, I can't fall asleep. Like I found myself stuck in a state before sleep and I can stay in my bed for hours in that state, but I'm calm and my muscles are relaxing, but my brain doesn't shut down. I'm very anxious and I have many OCDs in my life. I keep telling myself it's only a 30 cases that has been documented. How could I be one of them? But sometimes my brain tells me, what if you have it, you tremble and you have problems with memory and your thoughts are not clear. I saw your YouTube channel, a case of this Brazilian guy named Gaspar, said he had SFI and said some memory problem. I wouldn't know how he's doing. Um, and last, thank you for your time. I would notice again that you're doing a great job. Uh, finding any advice uh, will help me. Hey, thanks, thanks to you um, for um, for uh, sending me uh, this email. Uh, as I mentioned <laughs> twice already, super, super helpful with questions uh, like like these ones. So um, I think one thing that I've meant to say uh, in the last few weeks here to um, people like yourself that are worried that they have one of these extremely rare conditions is the following that w one thing that is is uh, true for everyone that has insomnia is that um, let's let's put it this way when 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 you have tr when somebody develops trouble sleeping it it often seems like really bizarre and unusual because it, it's something I hear all the time is like sleeping is so natural everybody should be able to sleep and I can't sleep. There must be really something really wrong with me. And and again, it, it may it, it it may seem from the inside perspective as if it's really weird, odd, and bizarre. And while from the outside perspective, from somebody like from my perspective, who's who's uh, taking care of a lot of people with insomnia in my clinic and who've interacted with a lot of people here that have trouble sleeping, um, it is virtually never any surprises like you see the patterns you hear the same things over and over again and why am i bringing this up well it's because when somebody has trouble sleeping and they perceive their own you know insomnia as like very unique and special and unusual then they're often um they often try to find like a unusual reason for it and maybe uh some kind of unusual and unique special treatment for it as well which um you know is is really never helpful um on the in the on the flip side of that when somebody is kind of realizing that you know what a lot of people have had similar problems to myself and although there's always like you know there's always little things that are different from person to person overall it's you know my trouble sleeping is very similar to that person's trouble sleeping then it kind of like it kind of like um, it makes the trouble sleeping less uh, of a mystery. It becomes something more ordinary, something more mundane. And then when we start thinking of our insomnia as like, mm, I just have like ordinary insomnia, like so many other people, then it takes away power from the insomnia. It's like, you know, it's not that unusual. It's not, you know, um, it's not that rare. And that also means that what's working for other people probably will work for me too. And that kind of builds confidence and and, and that really becomes a path towards like sleeping well again. And here's here's what I wanted to say. And, and what I just said is kind of a general thing that I, I say a lot to everyone, but my recent thinking uh, and 
realization, if you will, is that I feel like, you know, um, the the tendency that all, very many people with insomnia have to think of their own insomnia as like kind of unique and special and unusual. Well, thinking that one has sporadic fatal insomnia is almost kind of the extreme of that, you know? It's like thinking that one's own trouble sleeping is like extremely, extremely, like it's an extremely rare case. Like imagine 30 people in the history of humanity. Well, you know, granted we haven't been documenting for for most of the existence of humans, but 30 cases thinking that one has that is like uh, somewhat extreme. And then that said, as I, as I like to point out, nothing here is medical device. Like everybody has to, to take, you know, see the doctor when they're concerned about their health, like you have. But, but again, I feel like, you know, the, the concern about having sporadic fatal insomnia is kind of an extreme form of this, um, this belief that one's own trouble sleeping is unique. Um, so, uh, I, th- I think that's really helpful because again, when we, when you start realizing that, you know, the type of trouble I sleep, trouble sleeping I have is similar to others, that often becomes like a first step towards really sleeping better. Um, okay. So, um, um, so again, without giving any, you know, nothing here's medical device, I had to point, I said, I just, I, just as I said, uh, what you describe here, uh, to work in your email is very, very common things. Um, you know, uh, you know, when people have like like shaking, twitching, trembling, uh, kind of nervousness, uh, you know, of, um, uh, jolts of energy, things like that. That's uh, that. Those are things that um, typically are caused by hyper arousal. Hyper arousal is that state when your mind is like really like super alert, super aware of what's going on. Like, um, I I just made a recent episode of this. I feel like I just talked about this, but it's kind of like one step below frank worry or frank anxiety like you almost you may not even know that you're anxious but you have that hyper arousal that kind of extra energy and um uh not finding words uh uh uh, things like that are not uncommon at all um and uh, i i'm i feel tired but i can't fall asleep um all these things are very very common uh so uh, so yeah, I'd say uh, you know to anyone that has trouble sleeping, uh, the first thing uh, to try, uh, I believe, is for you know again virtually everyone should should be doing cognitive behavioral therapy or, or a variety of that, where we you know try to spend less time in bed, focus less on sleep, um, you know behavioral activation like being like doing things during the day that we enjoy to do, and and the the, the more we can like shift attention away from sleep, the the more and better sleep we 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 will start getting so okay i hope this is helpful and um anyone out there that um uh has found this uh these podcasts helpful please um consider rating it that is extremely extremely appreciated um if uh if you feel like you have a question then please uh, send it uh if you feel like you know i I, this is really good, but I, I would like like a, some more structured approach and a little bit more uh, coaching, personal coaching going forward. If you have an iPhone, please consider down, downloading Bedtime with a Y, which is uh, an app where, where I'm uh, where I'm coaching and I create a curriculum that I think is really good. And um, yeah, uh, I will conclude there. And uh, I have a, um, a comment from Josh that I really want to talk about tonight. So I'm definitely going to upload a video uh, tonight. So uh, look out for that and uh, hope you have a really, really nice uh, rest of your day. And uh, I'll be back soon as mentioned. Okay. Bye now.